right, so welcome everyone to this week's What Physicists Do. It's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Kevin Satzinger. So Dr. Satzinger did his bachelor's degree at Truman State and then went to UC Santa Barbara for his PhD, where actually he spent a good amount of his time um, when he was at Santa Barbara, actually at University of Chicago, although your PhD was still Santa Barbara, right? Uh, yep. Kevin, that's right. So I think he'll tell us a little bit about that. Um, and now he works at a quantum or Google Quantum AI, where they're working to build quantum computers. So with that, welcome Dr. Satzinger. Thanks so much for being here today. Great, thanks a lot, Professor Miller. Um, thanks everybody for coming. I wish I could be up on your campus in person right now, but I'm not too far away. I'm down in beautiful Goleta, California. Um, so we're at least not too far out. Um, and today I wanna to give an overview about quantum computing with superconducting circuits. And before I delve too deep into it, I wanted to tell you a little more about myself and um, Professor Miller provided a kind introduction here, but really I see myself, I see a lot of similarities between where I was sitting 10 years ago and maybe where a lot of the students here are sitting now. And I wanted to emphasize that connection um, because I went to Truman State University, which is in Missouri, and this is a public liberal arts college, and it's very similar to Sonoma State. It's a little bit smaller, about 5,000 students, but very similar mission and scope. Um, and I had a great time there and, and did some research there on campus, which I highly recommend you try to do at Sonoma, and also did a few internships and research experience for undergraduate programs. And I definitely recommend that you seek those out. I know it's been a weird last year, uh, but hopefully in the next couple of years, regular internships will, will come around again. And by the way, Google also has an internship program, both in quantum in particular, but also just generally in software engineering and so forth. Um, so if you're interested in, in any of that, please feel free to shoot me an email. My email is on the title slide and we'll, we'll, get, we'll flash it up again at the end. Um, as Professor Miller mentioned, in the middle of graduate school, I moved from the University of California, Santa Barbara to the University of Chicago. And this is something that happens sometimes. My advisor, Andrew Cleland, got recruited by a different university and I moved along with him, but it worked out great. Um, and I had a really fun um, thesis project. I'll tell you a little bit about that during this presentation, although you could have a whole colloquium about it. But for the last two or three years, I've been working at Google here in Santa Barbara. And um, what I wanna tell you today is some background on how quantum computing works and what we're doing at Google. In particular, I'm gonna follow this outline. So first, let's just delve into some quantum physics and I'll try to make this introductory. So maybe if you're a freshman, you haven't had any quantum physics in your curriculum yet, I'm hoping I can still take you along here for part one. And in part two, we'll take some of what we learned in part and apply it to quantum computing, see what that's all about. And finally, specifically focus on superconducting qubits, which is the implementation that we are pursuing for quantum computing in the Google group. So let's get started. Quantum physics. Well, the, the best quantum physics thing to start with, in my opinion, is the electron spin. And the fact is that an electron acts like a little bar magnet. Uh, it's as though it's a little mass with charge that's sort of spinning around and it has angular momentum and a magnetic moment. It's not literally spinning around, it's kind of weird, but that's a good thing you can think about. And the first time that many civilizations in the galaxy probably run into electron spin is through something called the 21 centimeter line, which is very important in radio astronomy, not the subject of this colloquium, but let's take a brief diversion. So on the right is a photograph of the cover of the record that was sent out uh, by NASA in the 70s on the Voyager space probe. And this is a record like a uh, spinning disc with grooves on it uh, that contains a lot of data about humanity. And actually the way that they establish a time scale on the record is using this 21 centimeter line, which is um, a particular wavelength of radiation that's very common in the galaxy that comes about, it's, it's indicated in the corner here. It comes about because of a transition between hydrogen where the spin of the proton and electron line up or where they, anti-align. And so any civilization is going to run into this once they're starting to look up into the stars and it establishes a time scale. So that's that's like a cool thing about electron spin to get us started, but it's not the subject of this colloquium. Instead, we want to focus on the quantum physics of this electron spin and then try to figure out how we can use it to harness it for computational capabilities. So 
I'm an experimental physicist. I like measuring things. Let's say we have an electron spin and we want to measure uh, what direction is this electron spin pointing? Well, there's a classic experiment, which is from 100 years ago, when folks were just starting to think about these spins and magnetic moments and atoms and electrons and stuff. And that's by Stern and Gerlach. Uh, you can see the citation on the lower right. The journal is this German journal that's very long title. Um, the fact, the underlying fact that we need here is that a gradient in magnetic field will exert a force on a magnetic dipole. And we can understand that pretty well with this schematic. So imagine that we have a magnetic field that's pointing down and higher up, it has a very strong magnitude. And as we go down closer to the floor, it becomes weaker in magnitude. Then this will exert a force on a magnetic dipole that depends on the orientation of the dipole. So for example, here, the North Pole will get pulled along the direction of the field and the South Pole will get pulled opposite the direction of the field. And you can see since the South is higher up in this picture, it's going to get a larger force. So this orientation will get a net force up. But if you have it flipped around, so the North Pole is more up, then you'll have a net force downward. So the essential idea is if we can set up a magnetic field like this and send some magnetic moments through like our electrons, then uh, that'll exert a force and it can separate the electrons. We can see uh, what's going on. Minor detail we're going to ignore. Electrons also have charge and charges moving through magnetic fields is a whole thing. Actually, Stern and Gerlach use silver atoms, which have this spin, but are neutral in charge. But let's not worry about that right now. OK, so let's say we have a beam of electrons uh, that we can shoot out of like a ray gun. And we want to figure out what kind of spins are, are we, uh, do we have going on in here? And say we have it set up so that the spins coming out of the electron gun have a random orientation. There's no reason for them to point in a particular way. They're pointed all over the place. So what would you expect to happen if you take this beam of electrons and shoot it through this strong magnetic field or this uh, uh, gradient in magnetic field? Well, if you aren't spoiler alert looking ahead on all this quantum stuff, you might think, okay, well, you know, some of it's sort of spin pointing up, some of it's kind of sideways, so it'll just go straight through, some of it's kind of down, you know, and you might get like a blob like this, but that isn't what happens. Something magical happens instead. You get two blobs, one up here and one down here. And that seems kind of weird because if you had one of these uh, magnetic dipoles pointed sideways, in the picture I was showing you, you might think there wouldn't be any force on it, so it should just go right down the middle. But that's not what happens. This is uh, one genesis of quantum mechanics. So this is really foundational to quantum theory. Let's, let's look at a few more experiments to see if we can grapple with this a little bit. If we send in all of the electrons aligned spin up, which is sort of uh, anti-aligned with this field, then everybody ends up up here. If they're all spin down, they all end up down here. If you rotate it like 60 degrees, then three quarters of them end up up here and 25% of them end up down here. And that seems pretty weird, but that's what happens. And grappling with exactly how this shakes out is very important to quantum theory. If we try to abstract this picture a little bit more, we can take that whole stern gerlach apparatus and put it in this box here. And this measurement, the action of this measurement is to take an electron spin pointing any direction. An electron spin in real life can point in any direction and to measure it along an axis. Like we can specify the Z axis for up and down. And what we're going to do is each time we do a measurement, we're going to have the machine like record the result so that we get a definite result for each electron and then spit out the electron either in the plus Z bin or in the minus Z bin. And all the electrons that get spat out up here are pointed up and all the electrons down here are pointed down. If we have an angle theta with respect to the z-axis and we measure a bunch of electrons with that same angle, we'll get a probability distribution, which is given by, by these cases here. And there are a few limiting cases you can check on, like if theta equals zero, then you're going to get spin up for everybody. If theta equals pi, you're going to get spin down for everybody. And if theta is pi over two, you'll get half and half which is kind of weird, but it's really the way that the world works. Another way to look at this is superposition. So I mentioned that the electron in real life can point in any old direction, but yet also when we do this measurement, we're always either going to get 
aligned or anti-aligned, up or down with respect to our apparatus. And the way to reconcile those is that if an electron spin is pointing in some other direction, we can express that state as a superposition of up and down, which has some component of it that it's up and some component that is down. Uh, and this notation is what physicists use for um, in quantum mechanics, which is related to linear algebra. So these are things that you'll run into throughout your, your curriculum. So we have spin up and we have spin down. And in this representation, I'm looking at the surface of this sphere and sort of this yellow arrow is representative of where this, the direction the spin is pointing. So it could point in any direction. And there are some specific ones we can, we can check out, like say what's pointed in the plus X direction, which is out of the slide. We can identify that with this superposition up plus down, which is kind of weird. Uh, if you send in something that's pointed along plus X, it's this sort of half and half superposition of up and down. But if you measured it along the X axis instead, you would always get out for this. We also have in, in differs from out because of this minus sign, this is crucial. And then we can also look along the Y axis instead. And the difference along the Y axis is the phase of this um, superposition. In fact, any state on the sphere, which is any orientation of the electron spin can be represented like this. Psi is a common um, label for an arbitrary quantum state. And we have the, these sines and cosines, and then we have this phase here. And this is essentially spherical coordinates, but from a different point of view. I wanted to conclude this section about like the beginnings and introduction to quantum mechanics with something else quantum. So this is a minor indulgence because I'm going to talk about my PhD thesis a little bit. People love talking about their PhD theses. Uh, and we were talking about spins and sp these spin one half systems are two level systems. And that's important for qubits, we'll get to that. But harmonic oscillators also behave quantum mechanically. And this is something you'll run into in any physics curriculum, like a mass on a spring or a pendulum, that kind of thing. Uh, and a mass on a spring, like you have a mass, you can displace it. There's a force exerted because of the spring, it'll oscillate, that's great. But what if I told you that actually the motion of such a thing can also behave quantum mechanically? And in fact, that's true, but it's hard to make it happen in real life because there's all sorts of things in our macroscopic classical world that make the features of quantum mechanics in this context very difficult to observe. Things are hot, things are wiggling around, um, there's all kinds of stuff happening. Well, let's focus on one, one specific example of such an oscillation near and dear to my heart, which is surface acoustic waves. These are vibrations on the surface of a solid. It's very similar to ocean waves on the water, but in a solid instead. And these actually have a lot of technological applications. You probably have some of these in your cell phone. They're used for radio frequency filters, for example, because the wavelength of the wave is very closely related to the frequency of the vibration. And this is technologically very useful, but we're here for the science right now. So it turns out these surface acoustic waves, these vibrations of like, trillions and trillions, 10 to the 20 atoms on the surface of a solid can also behave quantum mechanically. And my PhD thesis, which you can check out, just Google me, um, is about making something basically vibrate and not vibrate at the same time. So I wanted to show you a couple of these cool pictures. This is actually a photograph of some room temperature measurements where I have these probes coming in and measuring acoustic waves kind of bouncing around between these colorful rectangles. And so the key, um, experimental results that we achieved down there were swapping between a phonon and a photon. And that's what these oscillations are showing and creating a state that just has a single phonon. We also created a state with zero phonons. Um, but the single phonon is interesting because we have this negative quasi probability. This is um, a Wigner function related to a Wigner function or Wigner distribution, which is cool. Um, and I wanted to bring this up because I like it and the pretty pictures, but also because it has a connection to the superconducting circuits. Because the way that I did this experiment was by coupling the surface acoustic wave device, which is basically these lines of metal that can excite some voltages on a particular material, connecting that to a superconducting qubit, which is this blue plus sign on the left. But we're gonna talk more about superconducting circuits in part three. So remember to stay tuned for part three because that's not here quite yet. The next thing that I wanna talk about though is quantum computing. 
we were just talking all about some basic quantum physics, these spins and so on. Let's see if we had control over a bunch of these spins or similar analogous systems, what could we do? What is, what's the deal with quantum computing? First to explain this, I wanna go through a, a model for classical computing and draw an analogy to quantum computing. So, okay, everybody has a classical computer. You're on one right now watching this presentation. And what we need for our computing model is a physical representation of the information. For example, whether these light bulbs are on or off, uh, it could be whether your, um, your little magnetic domains in your solid state disk are what state they're in, um, could be in, on an abacus, whether some beads are in whatever positions. So we need some physical representation of the, the information, which is digital information. Then we need an abstract representation of that information. And for us, that is classical bits, binary digits, zeros and ones. And the next thing we need is to be able to take that, that information and manipulate it in some way to do something useful or cool or whatever. And the way that we do that in, in computing is using Boolean logic gates. So you can imagine having some inputs, A, B, C, and D. We feed in some bits there. You can do some Boolean logic, some algebra to them, and have some outputs. Um, and this is how any computer works. You'll, you'll run into this in electronics class, for example. The last step is to figure out what the outcome was. And this would be like, you hook up J and K to some lights and you look at them to see if they're lit up or not. So you can see what the result is. We're gonna come back to this and use this as um, sort of a foundation for an analogy to quantum computing. But before that, we need to get quantum. And the, the fundamental building block is the quantum bit or qubit. And this is a quantum system with two basis states. This is very, this is analogous to the zeros and ones we were just talking about. And it is also analogous to the spin up and down that we were just talking about. So this picture should look familiar, but I've just changed some of the labels that are in here. So we're identifying one state as the zero state and another state as the one state. But the weird thing is, the quantum thing is that the state of a qubit can also be a superposition of those two. For example, it can be in the state we call plus, zero plus one. It can be in the state zero minus I one can be in any state on this sphere with this exact same expression. And this is why I wanted to bring up the spin one half and go through the, the details of the states and the different orientations and so on so that this could be a little less abstract. But the truth is there are many different manifestations of physical systems that can act like this. And different ones have been uh, proposed for use technologically as quantum bits. I have listed a few examples over on the left-hand side. We were talking about the electron spin. That's a good example. But atomic energy levels also count. Now, atoms actually have a bunch of energy levels. But if you have two that have a unique energy difference between them, and then there's a unique frequency associated with them, you can kind of just zoom in and only pay attention to those two energy levels, as long as you're careful and um, you, you choose wisely. Another example is photon polarization. If you're really into optics, you might have run into the Poincaré sphere, which is very similar to the Bloch sphere. Um, and the final example, which we'll get much deeper into later on, is superconducting circuits. And superconducting circuits, again, have many different energy levels, kind of like an atom, but as an engineered system. And the trick is to, to set things up so you can pay attention to just two of those levels, and then that acts as your qubit. Now, if you have multiple qubits, things start to get interesting. A single qubit, you know, the classical bit could be zero or one, not much going on. Quantum bit, we've been talking about position, that's all cool. If you have two classical bits, there are four different values that you can take on, but it'll just be one of those values, zero, one, two, or three. But for two quantum bits, things start to get interesting. What you can have is instead of a superposition over just these two possibilities, you can have a superposition over all four possibilities where if you measure the two qubits at the end, the probability of seeing one of these outcomes is proportional to the magnitude squared of its coefficient. And this continues to blow up exponentially. Like if you have three quantum bits, then you can be in the superposition of eight different things. And there's kind of a lot of hidden data that exists in the three quantum bits because there are these eight different numbers, which are complex numbers. They can be uh, any continuous value. 
So there's a lot of richness there versus the classical bits where the state of the system will be defined by one number. Uh, so it takes a lot of information to describe this state and that's all naturally baked into the quantum system. This is one source of the power of quantum computing, but we'll get back to that idea. I wanna talk a little bit about how we manipulate qubits because I'm talking about having a computer. If you have a regular classical computer, you can like type something in and save the data to your memory or your hard drive or whatever. And, and that way you can control the data that exists on your, on your computer. We do something similar with quantum systems using quantum logic gates. So for example, this gate Y, one way to interpret this is very geometrically looking at this sphere is to rotate the state by 180 degrees about the Y axis. So you can use operations like this to do arbitrary rotations in the space of states on the sphere. But two qubit gates are where it gets interesting because this is how you get entanglement. And let's look at one specific, specific example of a controlled knot gate, which basically says if qubit A is in the one state, then flip qubit B. And here's an example. Suppose qubit A starts in the state zero plus one, which we called plus before pointed along the X axis and qubit B is in zero. So then we start out in this, oh, I wrote this wrong. Well, anyway, we start out in the state zero, zero plus this maybe should be uh, one, zero, but it depends if you're big Indian or little Indian or whatever. So we're gonna let it slide. Anyway, zero, zero plus zero, one is what this says. Then we do this controlled knot. And what that's saying is, if this qubit is one, it's going to flip that qubit. So this turns into zero, zero doesn't change, but zero, one changed into one, one. And this is a very simple example of a quantum circuit, which you read very similarly to sheet music with time going to the right. And then different qubits are sort of like different notes you can play. This state zero, zero plus one, one is actually very interesting. It exhibits a property called entanglement. And I would invite you to consider what would happen if you had this state and you gave qubit B to your friend and they put it on an airplane, on an airplane and they flew to the other side of the world and you each had one of these qubits. What would that mean? What, what would happen if you measured your qubit? What would that tell you about what would happen if your friend measured their qubit? And does it matter who measured their qubit first? This is a whole thing. Uh, I'm not going to get into it in this colloquium, but for more information, check out the EPR paradox and the Bell inequality, which resolve this issue. This is a very foundational quantum uh, notion. But there's a, also an application of this, which is quantum cryptography. Because if you imagine that you and your friend share this entangled state, you're able to establish a shared secret where you two both know a particular random number that nobody else knows. And actually there are protocols so you can make it secure and guaranteed that nobody's even eavesdropped because somebody else eavesdropping is kind of like a measurement which um, disturbs the system. So there are, there are applications in quantum cryptography so that you can share information in a more secure way. And that's something else you may be interested in and looking into more detail. But now let's go back to this model for computing and try to create the quantum version. So we need a physical representation of our information. The thing we've been talking about so far is this electron spin, although later on a better one for, for my work would be the superconducting circuits. What, whatever physical representation you have, you can have the same abstract representation, which is like these superpositions of states with these amplitudes associated with probabilities and so on. We have a way to manipulate these states by sending them through these quantum logic gates. And then we have a way of measuring what happens at the end. And in this case, what you want to come up with at the end usually is a probability distribution associated with several qubits. So you can basically prepare the same starting state and run the circuit maybe thousands of times and come up with a probability distribution of which states were more likely then if you have wisely constructed your algorithm, that probability distribution will tell you something good that you wanted to know. Let's return to this idea of the power of quantum computing. Uh, it really comes, comes in through this superposition and entanglement, but this is a nice illustration. Say we start in some initial state and we do some operations, we'll end up in some entangled superposition maybe. Then as we do more operations, if you've designed your algorithm wisely, you'll get this property called quantum interference, where it will become more likely that, that you 
you measure a particular bit string at the end, which has something interesting or useful about it. That is, when you're writing the algorithm, you don't know what outcome you're going to get because that's the whole point is you're trying to figure this out. But you construct the circuit so that it will reveal to you what that information was through the power of its computation. And so this idea of interference of things sort of adding up and canceling out is crucial to how quantum computing can work. And I'll talk a little bit more about about like what are some interesting things that have actually been happening in quantum computing. At the end of the presentation, I'll, I'll review a few of our recent articles for some applications. To close this section on quantum computing, I wanted to talk about errors. And there are two kinds of errors I want to describe to you because the truth is that these quantum systems are not perfect. And right now it's a research area where uh, there's a lot of ongoing work and development that needs to happen. And it's not like a robust technology like your cell phone, where everything just works perfectly all the time. Uh, so the first kind of error that I wanted to tell you about is energy decay. And this is what happens uh, when, when the qubit sort of decays into one particular state because it's losing energy. If there weren't any damping or losses, then a spin in a magnetic field will just process around forever. And the frequency of this precession is given by like the magnetic moment and the magnetic field and stuff like that. That's cool. That's what we want our qubit to do. But if there's damping and loss, you can imagine the sort of sloshing around and eventually settling, just pointing up. And that's sort of what the squiggle is all about. So we can decay to just pointing up. And that's bad news because, you know, whatever you started out with, your beautiful quantum superposition and your entanglement and whatever, if you have too much damping and loss, then it's all just going to decay into this up state, which isn't going to do you any good. So this is the qubit relaxing. And there's a time constant associated with this. Usually this is an exponential process. And the time constant is called T1, um, just for your information. Another kind of error that I want to discuss is dephasing. And um, I'll get to this subtitle because I have an analogy that I want to draw for this, but let me just explain it in the dry way first. So imagine that from run to run, you have an inconsistency in the frequency of the qubit for some reason. Maybe the strength of the magnetic field is varying, or if you're using like a circuit, like some kind of quantum integrated circuit, some of your voltages are fluctuating or whatever. Uh, then if the frequency varies run to run, then you'll sort of process at different rates from run to run. And the problem is that usually we want to measure probabilities. And so if you want a probability distribution, you have to repeat this thing like thousands of times. And if each time is a little bit different because the frequency is a little bit wrong each time, then that average will sort of be smeared out and it won't quite tell you what you wanted to know. Uh, another way of saying this is that the phase coherence of the state decays over time. And this has a different time constant, which is commonly called T2. I want to get back to the subtitle here. Uh, I don't know if the youth these days use the radio anymore, but it's this ancient technology where um, somebody broadcasts music over radio waves from a centralized tower, and you can pick it up on your car, um, sort of like a satellite, but even lower tech. So imagine you're listening to the radio in your car on the freeway, you're driving down the 101 because you want to visit us in Santa Barbara, and you go through a tunnel. And say you're singing along to the song. Well, once the radio cuts out, you can't hear the song anymore. But if you keep singing and you keep driving, eventually you'll get to the end of the tunnel. And then when you get to the end of the tunnel, the radio comes back on. You can, you can figure out if you managed to stick to the beat or if you were going too fast or going too slow. If you have very good phase coherence, then every time you drive through the tunnel listening to this song, you're really into this particular song, uh, you'll be right on cue every time you'll always be synced up. But if you're not so musically talented, maybe from time to time, each time you run through the tunnel, sometimes you're a little fast, sometimes you're a little slow. That's basically what's going on with this dephasing is sometimes the qubits are a little ahead and sometimes they're a little behind. But, you know, we all make mistakes. Qubits make mistakes. Students make mistakes. Uh, PhD people make mistakes. And there are ways to cope with this. So for example, in the near term, we have a couple of coping strategies. If you have these time constants over which things tend to go wrong for your qubits, just try to make your algorithms short, shorter than these time constants like T1 and T2. And it's less likely that errors happen. And it's more likely that you get the result that you're looking for. 
But there's a tension here because in order to do something genuinely useful with a quantum computer, you want a lot of qubits and you want to be able to do a lot of operations. And so just making things short is, is okay from a research point of view, but it makes it much more difficult to use these devices to do something useful. There are other strategies, like you can incorporate tricks into your algorithm, sort of like uh, checks to make sure that you have good data. For example, if you know that you're supposed to have a particular number of ones in your output bit string, but you're not sure exactly which output bit string you're going to get, then you can discard all the data where you have the wrong number of ones. And that way you're discarding a, a certain class of mistakes that might happen. So these mitigation strategies can work and they can really clean up your data a lot, but it takes a lot of care. Longer term, there's a whole research area into quantum error correction, which is something that I'm personally very enthusiastic about. And this particular picture and cited article is an older review article, but a very intuitive pedagogical review article. So if you're interested in this, check out this article, but realize that in the last decade, there have been a lot of advances. So it's a little bit out of date, but still a very good resource. And the essential idea here is to take the quantum information that you might have on one qubit, one spin or whatever, and to spread it out over a large number of separate physical qubits, like maybe hundreds of them or thousands. And if you had, if you had the information distributed suitably, you can make it immune to local errors. And the basic way that that works is uh, you can have a situation where if a couple of qubits have a problem with their phase or they have a T1 relaxation or something, you can detect it, but it still preserves the larger um, overall quantum state that you're interested in, this logical quantum state. And that's what's sort of depicted here with this big array of qubits and we have these logical operations which span across uh, the array. But this is a whole thing also, but this, this is something I'm, I'm very interested in. Okay, that's enough for quantum computing. Let's get a little more specific and talk about superconducting qubits, which are the technology that we're using at Google. Remember this, this was a slide I was very enthusiastic about, it involved my PhD thesis, people love their PhD thesis. And this is the conclusion to that, uh, where we're going to talk about how these superconducting circuits work. So the, the fundamental element, sort of the transistor of um, superconducting circuits, if you want, is the Josephson junction. And this is kind of a weird circuit element, but it's sort of like a resistor or a capacitor or an inductor that you may have already learned about. In fact, it's most like an inductor. We'll get to that. So essentially a superconductor or a Josephson junction is two pieces of superconductor that are next to each other that have a thin barrier between them or some kind of constriction between them so that there isn't sort of direct current between them, but, but it only happens because electrons quantum tunnel between the two sides. And um, there is a voltage that can exist across that barrier. There's a current that can be flowing through that barrier, which can be AC, so alternating. Um, and this slide is going to get a little bit too into the details, so I'm not gonna sweat it. Uh, you have some relations for the current and voltage. This is sort of like Kirchhoff's laws for like resistors and currents and stuff like that. Um, and there's a way to use these to derive what the essential behavior of this thing is. And the essential behavior of it is that it's a nonlinear inductor. And inductor is, is meaning it doesn't like it when you change the current that's flowing through it. It'll exhibit a voltage in response to a change in current. Now, nonlinear is saying the value of that inductance depends on the amount of current that's flowing through it. The nonlinear aspect of this is actually essential to making it into a superconducting qubit, because it means when we use this in a resonant circuit in a minute uh, to make our superconducting qubit, the frequency of that resonant circuit will change based on how much current is flowing through it. And that way we can isolate just two levels. Um, and that's a really essential detail that um, I can't give too good of justice to right here. Um, but this is an essential ingredient. The fact that it's nonlinear is very important. On the right is an electron microscope picture that I took in Chicago of a Josephson junction that I made. Um, and this is using a standard technique from the 70s, where basically you want two paddles of aluminum, this bottom electrode and this top electrode, to sort of crisscross on each other. And there's a thin layer of aluminum oxide that we grow between them. And it's through that barrier that the electrons tunnel through. 
we can use these junctions in order to make a qubit. And the particular qubit that we're using at Google is called the Transmon, which uh, comes from this paper from 2007. It's also in Dave Schuster's thesis from Yale in 2007, was the, the first experiments on this. Um, Dave Schuster is now a professor at the University of Chicago. So the idea is to take these junctions and to connect them to a capacitor. And you may have learned that a capacitor and an inductor can create a resonance. And this is just like that, except that since the junctions are nonlinear, it creates these, these uneven energy levels. And I haven't explained that enough uh, for it to make sense on its own. So I apologize. But basically, we want to use the lowest two energy levels from that uh, array of energies as our qubit. So we're going to just pay attention to those bottom two light levels and try to ignore the rest of them. Actually, the rest of the letter levels can be important, they can be useful, but we're not gonna sweat that here today. And this is a, a picture of what one of these looks like. This is very similar to the one from my PhD thesis, which was based on this. Uh, so we have a piece of metal here in the middle. This is a film of aluminum on sapphire. And that film is connected between the plus sign and the surrounding plane, which is connected to ground through these junctions. So it's going through these little wires here through the junction, which is right here. Now let's talk about um, some basic sort of control and operation of these superconducting qubits. The first thing is Rabi oscillations. And this is sort of like hello world for a qubit. If you can do Rabi oscillations, you've proven to yourself that you have a qubit that's working. And this is resonant transitions between zero and one, those lowest two states. And the way that we do that in this case is we have this drive over here. It's a wire that connects to a coaxial cable that we put some six gigahertz AC signal into. And if we scan that frequency and tune everything just up just right, so that frequency lines up with the resonance frequency of the qubit, we can get these oscillations. And we'll talk more about how the readout works in a moment, but basically this readout signal changes as a function of the power that we put in or the amplitude of this AC signal. And if we don't drive at all, that's where we're in the zero state. If we drive a decent amount, we hop up to the one state. But this is the interesting thing about a qubit. If you keep driving, there isn't anywhere for the energy to go because there isn't a higher level for you to get to is the essential idea here with the qubit. So actually you start kind of undriving yourself and you end up oscillating back between zero and one, zero and one. What you wouldn't want would be to accidentally excite these higher states. Uh, that's called leakage, and that's something that we're trying to avoid. But this data set provides us sort of our first calibration, which is if we do a pulse that has this particular amplitude, we call that a pi pulse because it's a 180 degree rotation that takes us between the zero state and the one state. That's very useful to have available. Let's talk more about measurement though. So there is the qubit we were looking at before, and it's coupled to another element. And this is a linear resonator, which is sort of an intermediary between the qubit and the outside world. And this wire up here, we can send a signal in, and the signal that comes out, we'll put it through some amplifiers and so on, and eventually we'll measure the signal. Now, the fact is that the frequency of this linear resonator depends on the state of the qubit. And that's because there's this inductance down here, which changes depending on what state the qubit's in. And this is coupled into there, so it can sort of smell that change in inductance. And if we measure the, the output phase uh, that's coming out on the right-hand side up here as a function of the frequency that we're measuring up here, if we look with the qubit in the zero state, we see one uh, transition frequency, this resonance here. But if we excite the qubit, that moves down by a couple of megahertz. And the point is, if you measure right in between, then that's going to give you some daylight between the red and the blue. So that if you measure a phase that's up here, it looks like the qubit's in zero. And if you measure a phase that's down here, it looks like the qubit is in one. And this is the superconducting circuits version of the stern gerlach experiments with the uh, gradient magnetic field stuff we were looking at earlier. We can do this. Uh, we can do this experiment and look at some more data. So uh, let's say we prepare the zero state and we just measure. We send in a pulse and we measure. And we do this like a thousand times. Then we can get this blob in the readout signal, looking at the magnitude and phase that comes out on the right side. And if we do the same thing and prepare in one, then we get this other blob that's over here. 
And then what we can say is, well, you know, if we draw this line down the middle, then whenever we do one measurement, we're going to get something that's on one side of this line. And if it's on the blue side, we're going to call it zero. And if it's on the red side, we're going to call it one. And that's the best we can do. Note, though, that sometimes we'll be wrong. There are a couple of blue points over here. There are a lot of red points over here. The reason that there's a decent number percent, couple percent of red points over here is because during this whole process, the qubit can decay. This is that T1 phenomenon, that energy relaxation phenomenon. So we always have to be on the lookout for that kind of thing. But this is a good way of seeing how that works. Now let's transition to sort of more contemporary, uh, recent cool hardware stuff that we've been working on in the group. So this is our latest processor that we've published about, which is the Sycamore processor. And this has 54 qubits in it. And one of the key technological advances, which I am not going to get into here, is that we have a simple coupler for each pair of qubits. And that lets each qubit sort of act on its own independently, trying to worry about what its neighbors are doing except when we want them to interact, we want those two qubit entangling gates, and then we can turn on the interactions for a brief period of time, you know, 10 or 20 nanoseconds in order to get the interaction to occur. And that allows us to have very high fidelity gates, really leading, uh, field leading fidelities over this large two-dimensional array of qubits. And I wanna go through some of the infrastructure that makes it possible to actually use such a device, such a processor in order to get good experimental data. So for example, electronics, we have developed our own custom scalable electronics to generate these control signals. So this is a photograph where you can see one of the boards in the center is a field programmable gate array and it's responsible for receiving instructions from a computer and then delivering data to some digital to analog converters like these chips here, which those signals then get routed through some filtering and stuff to these outputs. And then those output, outputs can be used directly. They can be routed into the fridge to the qubits directly to create arbitrary waveforms with basically a couple nanoseconds of time resolution. And it is also possible to upconvert them using mixers to create these sort of six gigahertz level signals and pulses that I was talking about. So this is how we control our qubits. We send in signals like this, and there's sort of analogous electronics for receiving and um, measuring the signals that come out on the other side. This is a picture showing a crate of a bunch of these cards together and a bunch of cables coming out. And this is like a lot of cables uh, in order to make this thing work. Um, but we're operating at scale and we're able to actually make this whole system uh, work. Although it doesn't look particularly scalable, if you wanted to make this 10 times bigger, that would be kind of a rough sell. So there is ongoing research in making the electronics more scalable, making these cabling solutions more scalable and so on. The fridge is very important. So something I've sort of glossed over just uh, casually mentioning superconductivity is that these things have to be very cold in order for them to work. Um, and in order to do that, we use a dilution refrigerator, which uses a mixture of helium-3 and helium-4. And the essential physics of how that works is very similar to evaporative cooling. Um, so if you learn how evaporative cooling works, then you're not that far from knowing how a dilution refrigerator works. It's just using different phases of this helium-3 and helium-4 mixture instead of phases of water like liquid and vapor. And this is a, a commercialized technology. You're able to buy these fridges. There are several companies that make them and they cool down to of order 10 millikelvin, uh, which is very cold. And it's good to be so cold for two reasons. One, we want the thermal energy of our system, this KBT to be much less than the energy of a single photon, uh, which would be around 300 millikelvin for the frequencies that we're looking at. And we also need to be, uh, clearly in the superconducting regime so that we don't have a bunch of um, weird stuff happening. And for aluminum, which is the material that we mostly use for superconductors, it has a critical temperature of one Kelvin. So 10 millikelvin is great, it's much less than these. Uh, along the way, you, you can see these cables routing from the bottom to the top. We need various filters at different temperature stages in order to filter out the noise from room temperature electronics. And then for signals coming out, we amplify at different stages as well. We have amplifiers at the cold, cold stage, we have amplifiers at around three Kelvin, and then at room temperature as well. And that staged amplification is a very efficient thing to do. It's very similar to how a staged rocket is much more efficient than having a single stage rocket. 
One more piece of technology is packaging. This is basically everything that goes between the processor and the fridge. So this is a circuit board. We have a bunch of little wires that connect the processor to the circuit board and that goes in a box here and we have some connectors so we can connect all these cables onto it. And this package is bolted to this fridge. You can see it over here. Now, last thing, if you had all this hardware, that's not enough either, because you need to figure out what control signals to actually send in in order to make the thing work. And that essential problem is the calibration problem. And we need to come up with like roughly 100 parameters for each qubit in order to make the thing work effectively. And this is something that I've personally worked on quite a bit. Uh, and the way that we solve this problem is by distilling it into this graph. We take all of the research that folks all over the world have come up with and turn it into this graph where it's sort of a sequence of calibrations, where each of these nodes represents an experiment and an automatic analysis that goes with it and some decision making that goes with it. And so we can have algorithms sort of traverse around this graph trying to fix stuff up and it actually works pretty well. But this is very important to automate, especially once you're getting into like dozens and dozens of things. If you just have a couple of things, you can park a graduate student in front of the computer for a weekend, it'll be fine. But we're at operating a larger scale now. Finally, I wanna close by reviewing some recent work from our team. And I am not going to talk about any of this in great detail here, there's no, no time for that. But I wanted to provide these references so that if you're interested in what we're up to, you can look up these papers and read them and, and see what you think. Um, one that made a big splash two years ago was this beyond classical computation, uh, where we set up sort of a specific benchmark, a specific well-defined computational problem where we thought our quantum processor would be able to outperform even a supercomputer. And we were able to execute that and do benchmarks on both the quantum processor and, and classical supercomputer and basically win the race, which was the first time something like that had ever been measured. Another recent one, which is touching more on applications, is this chemistry simulation, because one of the original notions behind quantum computing is that atoms and molecules and stuff themselves are profoundly quantum mechanical. So doing simulations of things like these molecular orbitals and so on is more naturally suited for a quantum computer than a classical computer. So this is doing some experiments in that realm. Another area where quantum computers are thought to perhaps be useful is optimization, uh, because you can explore this large space of possibilities. And this is a, a recent paper that we published um, working on that. You can see this kind of like working its way over to an optimum. And finally, there's a recent paper, which is still in press right now uh, on error correction that you might check out. One last thing, I am excited about this, uh, but I don't really have anything for it in the slide, is um, Tonight on Archive, which is this preprint server, I actually have a paper that I am first author of coming out, uh, which is about cool topological states on these quantum processors. It's actually the same processor as in this paper. So if you're interested, check that out. I think it's going to come on in within the next couple of hours. Uh, so look me up. Good. So let me conclude by reviewing this outline. So we talked about quantum physics. We have our bar magnet, electron, remember? quantum computing, and superconducting qubits. And uh, with that, let me wrap it up and we can spend the rest of the time on questions. And I want to mention again, this is my email. Feel free to shoot me an email. I get a lot of emails, so don't, don't worry about it at all uh, because I'd love to help you out and answer your questions. And again, Google has an internship program and I would encourage all of you to do research as undergraduates if this is interesting to you, both at Sonoma State and also RU programs, internships, and so on. It's a very valuable experience. Thanks again. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Satzinger, for the wonderful talk. I'll clap on behalf of everyone. I see that. Um, so if anyone has any questions, you're welcome to either put them in the chat or you can raise your hand um, if you'd prefer to vocally ask your question. Um, I guess I'll start with a quick one uh, about the internship. Do you know um, what prerequisites there are? Like, are these for more advanced stu students um, if an undergraduate? Great question. Upon? Great question. So the intern program is for both undergraduate and graduate students. Um, ordinarily, I would suggest that you have a couple, one or two of these research experiences under your belt already. So it's probably more suitable for maybe juniors and seniors. Um, the program is during ordinarily during the summer. Uh, this summer, I think we have everything 
pretty lined up at this point and it's virtual this year. I hosted an intern last summer as well, which we had to change to virtual at the last second. But I am uh, optimistic that subsequent years will be in real life, which is what, what you really want if you're trying to work on quantum computing hardware, for example. So I'd say I'd encourage you to do some REU program or internship or something and go ahead and apply. Great, thank you. So I see we have a question in the chat, which I don't know if you can see, I can read it to you though. So Laura asks, how does the power to run a quantum computer compare to an equivalent processing computer? That is a great question. Uh, and it's a whole thing because it's hard to sort of establish a fair comparison uh, because the, there are different strengths and weaknesses for different uh, computing platforms. Like quantum computers can be good at some specific things, but classical computers are here to stay. Now, for example, in this specific uh, publication over here, we had a well-defined, although admittedly contrived computational task that we were working on. And in the uh, supplementary information for this, we did we crunched the numbers and did some benchmarks and so on, comparing the power uh, costs of the quantum processor doing this, the same task as the supercomputer. And there was actually a huge difference. Uh, this, the supercomputer takes like a ton of power. Um, the quantum computer is, I don't recall exactly, but it's like tens of kilowatts or something. You're, if you have a fancy desktop computer that might use one kilowatt and you can imagine like a huge server farm with like hundreds of these things uh, gets up into even like megawatt territory pretty quickly. Most of the power cost for our systems comes from the refrigeration, um, which is basically like a really fancy refrigerator system, but it's using helium instead of what your refrigerator uses, which is probably like Freon or something. Um, and that takes a lot of work but it's still like tens of kilowatts, not thousands. Great, so our next question in the chat. So Bill asks, uh, when you make the measurement of the output, presumably using inductance, is this a source of noise since making the measurement may perturb the state of the qubit? And if quantum entangled with another qubit, will this affect it as well? Or do you see the question? <laughs> I, I don't see the question, but I do hear the question. Okay. Uh, so this is very good. So what happens is, say the qubit is in some really fancy entangled state with all kinds of cool stuff going on, and we do this measurement. What really happens is the photons, and it's not that many photons that we zap through here, um, become entangled with the qubit. And that's sort of weird because it's like we have this whole entangled state with amongst the qubits, and then also this qubit is entangled with all these other photons over here. It gets complicated but it's like the phase of these qubits depends on what the state of this qubit is. And as long as this superposition exists, then those also exist in the superposition. But at some point, probably around the amplifiers where we start really pumping up these signals, the quantum superposition breaks down and collapses and sort of reality chooses one of these possibilities. Um, and that then projects the qubits so that it is forced to be at whichever possibility it was. Um, so if we measure a point over here, then that essentially corresponds to forcing the qubit to be in the zero state. Although, as you can see from the size of these blobs and the red points and so on, we can make mistakes doing that. And that's related to the noise that you were talking about. And doing a measurement like this, where we're exciting this resonator can affect other qubits and like mess up other qubits frequencies, for example, a little bit. And that can cause dephasing one of these um, error sources that we were talking about before. So that's all very important. Last thing, if this qubit were, was previously in some kind of fancy entangled state and we do this measurement, we basically project that entangled state and we only take the part where this qubit is in say zero. Uh, and you can uh, start to get to the point where you wanna take pen and paper and work out the math uh, for that. But you can imagine if you have a few qubits in a three qubit state, and then you measure one of the qubits and you find out it's in zero, then you're sort of selecting down to the components where that qubit is in zero so that it's self-consistent. Great, thanks. So our next question, Kevin asks, um, how many super superconducting qubits will it have? And I you know you said you, your most recent one was, what was it 54 or something? 
Yes. Yeah. Um, so the, the present device that we're devices we're using for various papers and so on, it's in the 50s, 54. It's, uh, it's just because it's a multiple of six that we landed on for this generation. But, you know, onward and upward, um, we have some experiments that will require uh, a different arrangement that we're looking at. And, and when we want to use error correction, the sort of more long term uh, ambitions, then you really want hundreds or thousands of physical qubits to just make one logical qubit. And you need a lot of logical qubits to do something useful. So pretty rapidly, you start thinking about hundreds of thousands of physical qubits, which is orders of magnitude more than we have right now. So there's a lot of work to do. Although I'll say 54 sounds like a lot more than I remember the last time I had a check-in. Like, so it seems like. Onward and upward. Right, yeah. Um, great, so we have another question in the chat. So Hong Tao asks, um, how likely is it that the temperature can go up from a few millikelvin to a few kelvins in the coming years? Good question. So my, my interpretation of this is, how likely is it we can develop a technology that can operate at a few kelvin? Because that would be much easier than operating at 0 0.01 kelvin. If we could find something that operated at three or four kelvin, then we could use much simpler, cheaper, and easier refrigeration technologies that can um, take a higher power of heat load, for example. That depends. So for this particular technology, we're kind of up against the wall on the temperature because we're using this six gigahertz range of frequencies. Uh, you, um, you may be familiar with like 5G, which is a recent cell phone technology. There's a lot of recent work in microwave electronics to make it make very efficient, cheap, and high quality integrated circuits that operate at, in this like four to eight gigahertz range. And that's one reason that this frequency range is very appealing, but that frequency range demands a temperature that is like of this order, less than 0.1 Kelvins. So you need to either operate at a higher frequency, which is a research area that some have, um, some have been working on, uh, or you need to be able to cope with the fact that your system doesn't naturally cool down to its quantum ground state. So you can use some fancy control, for example, to force a state that is in initially in sort of a hot thermal state into a specific pure quantum state. So there's a lot of research on that. This particular technology, like transmon qubits, is not that amenable to this, but there are lots of other potential technologies that exist. And it, it's a worthy goal to try to make something like this work at a few Kelvin, because that would make a lot of the engineering aspects and a lot of the costs a lot easier. All right, great. So I think we're out of the questions in the chat. Was there any other questions from the audience? We're right at five, so maybe one more if, if someone really wants to ask one. All right, if not, then we're ending perfectly on time, which is amazing. So um, thank you again so much, Dr. Satzinger, for the wonderful talk. And thank you everyone for coming. So next week, we'll hear um, again more about quantum computing, actually. We'll have Dr. Christina Knapp, who's a theoretical physicist who works at Microsoft. Um, but she'll tell, be telling us about some cool things that might build off of today's talk. So it should be, should be fun. Hope you all can make it. And thank you again, Dr. Satzinger. Great. Thanks a lot, everyone. Have a great day.